Bible dedicated to helping Christians feel more comfortable in a chaotic world. And we're certainly in that chaotic world, and the words of the Apostle Peter, inspired of the Holy Ghost, should mean much to us and bring us comfort. And we're almost done now with the passage. This is Peter's final words to the church, and he says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for the kindness that you've given to us in a place of worship and a people with whom we can worship. Uh, We would ask, Father, that you would allow us to be fed today, that you would accomplish your will by the preaching of your word, Father, that as a church we confess is inerrant and inspired and and authoritative and, and it is sufficient for us. And so feed us with it, Father. Lord, I pray that you might give us unity, that you might strengthen us as a congregation, that you might give us fellowship that our heart needs, and I pray that we might be a light in an increasingly dark world, and that that light points to not ourselves, but to Christ, and we would ask that that would be your will as well, that you would accomplish uh, your will on earth through churches just like this one through the ordinary means of grace and the preaching of your word, the exposition of your scripture. And I pray that you would use it to give us what we need for this next week, whether that be encouragement or chastisement, whether it be, whether it be grace or law. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Peter is closing out the book of First Peter, his first letter to the persecuted church, He says something in this passage that ought to strike us as a little bit odd in that the apostle says, humble yourselves. Now, to humble ourselves means to make ourselves low. It is to prostrate ourselves. You might notice that with worship also comes prostration. That's what the word in Hebrew means. It is to bow down below someone else. How did that tradition ever start? What is the purpose of that? You might notice that a good dog even does that to its master. It will hunker down beneath him, even lower than the dog already is when it's trying to appease who it considers to be a greater being than it. The reason why is because, well, it's a visual display of how we view ourselves when compared to the one who we are addressing. It is a visual display of, I recognize that you are higher and I am lower. I recognize that you are in a different position than I am. So it's even a matter of falling on our face before the Lord to visually show what we already feel to be true in our hearts. But this concept of humbling yourself seems odd as it's given to a church that is persecuted, that is starved, that is hungry, that is despondent, that is depressed. We know the church to whom Peter was writing, and we know what they struggled with because he addressed their struggles. He was trying to encourage them. Why would he say, humble yourselves? You would think that the church was already sufficiently humbled. Well, I've learned this lesson along the way, and I've learned this lesson the hard way, and it's this. Everyone could stand to be more humble than what they are now. Uh, You know, one of the difficulties of being accused of pride, for example, is that the accusation is always true. Amen? The accusation is always true. And it's a bit of a gotcha. You can be somewhat unfair with that accusation because if I approach you and said, you're too prideful, the answer is obviously, yeah. I mean, everyone is. We don't think of ourselves the way God thinks of us and we find some reason in ourselves to think highly, more highly, the scripture says, more highly of ourselves, quote, than we ought, because we're not thinking highly enough of God. We could all stand to be more humble, but he's encouraging the church, even in the midst of difficulty, remain humble. Why? Well, because it says, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now, let me stop there for a moment. There's two principles at play. The first one we see throughout the scripture repeatedly, and it's that God gives grace to the humbled, but gives law to the proud. Remember that expression. It will come in handy in your life over and over again if you memorize that. Grace to the humbled, law to the proud. 
Now, the concept there is a division of how we look at Scripture, and we can put everything, more or less, as a way to help us out understand it. We can put everything in Scripture under one of those two categories. This is either grace or this is law. Law would be thou shalt not or thou shalt. The law is designed to make us humble because when we understand the law of God, we know how we've fallen short of it. The purpose of God's law is not to make us good. The purpose of God's law, as the catechism teaches, is to teach us our duty to make clear our condemnation and to show us our need of a Savior. The purpose of the law is to humble you before God to recognize this is exactly why you need to be saved. Because God's law says do this, but you clearly are not doing this, and you've done that, which God's law says not to do. But then there's the good news, that we can have a grace that we don't deserve, a favor that we did not merit, That's the good news. And here's who the law goes to. The law goes to the proud, to those who don't know that they're sinful, to those who don't know that they are not deserving of God's grace. They need law. But to someone who knows that they've sinned and they're brokenhearted over it, they're they're truly remorseful for what they've done, you don't then take the law and beat them with it to make them feel worse. They already feel sufficiently guilty. What they need is not law at all, but it is, it is grace. When I preach at gay pride events on occasion, I try to witness at those. We wear t-shirts that say, God gives grace to the humbled, but law to the proud. And And oftentimes people will say, why are you out here preaching against homosexuality? And I smile and say, you're not paying attention to what I'm preaching. And I try to focus only on sermons revolving around pride. Uh, Homosexuality is a sin, sure enough. But let's not forget that when I use the term gay pride, that's two sins involved, not one. There's the gayness of it all, but then there's also the pride, the the proudness in the face of God. As God says, be humble. Tone it down a notch. Realize your estate. You're not perfect. You need grace. Not only are you not perfect, but the scripture would call you wretched. This is why we need to see Jesus the opposite, or need Jesus. The opposite of that type of humility would be, I don't know, throwing a parade on the part of your sin to celebrate it. That would be an in-your-face to God, taking pride in that which I ought to be ashamed of or ashamed for. But we Christians are never beyond the point of shame in our own life, the point of humility, to recognize that even though I may avoid this one, this sin, or avoid that one, it is only by the grace of God. It's only by God's grace that I'm not driven in a certain way to do a certain thing. It's only by God's grace that I have the Holy Spirit's power to resist a particular temptation. We Christians should maintain our humility by repeating to ourselves over and over and over again that expression that I heard my grandma say many times as a kid, except by the grace of God, there go I. And if you remember that, that everything that you have, you've been given, it's hard to take pride in it. Uh, It's much easier to be humble when you realize that you have nothing worth having that was not given to you. You know, sometimes we have a compliment that we don't know what to do with, or at least I'm that way. When I got engaged and my friends and my family and so forth would meet my wife and they'd say, she's really beautiful. And I didn't know how to respond to that because it's like I didn't make her. What do I say? Do I say thank you as though I have something to do with it? Thank you. I I took a lot of time and effort on my part um, putting her together in a laboratory. I mean, she was just born that way. I didn't have anything to do with it. And the proper response, I suppose, would be praise God. Yes, it's not thank you. It's praise God. He gets the credit for any good thing in my life. Uh, God is the one who provides all of our gifts. We ought to remember that. But there's something else at play here, too. The reason why we humble ourselves now is so that God God can exalt us later. Trust me, we can climb up on plenty of ladders. We can can take to the top step. We can elevate ourselves in this life and make much of ourselves. But if you wait on God, he will elevate you when he's good and ready. And by the way, God gets special pleasure out of making much of him through small people. God rejoices in a little guy. He is pleased 
by glorifying himself, by picking someone that no one would necessarily suspect of any greatness and him being great through them. This is what he did with, I'd say, with uh, in, in, in most exemplary fashion, that of Gideon. Gideon, mighty man of valor. And Gideon says, who, me? Well, Gideon was small, or his family was small, and he was the least of them. But the reason why God chose him actually had nothing to do with Gideon and everything to do with God. We need to remember that. God will get us through difficulty, and not only will he get us through difficulty, if we do it with humility, he will exalt us. But it might need the reminder. It's not because we ought to be exalted, but when the attention or the spotlight is on us, we're constantly pointing back to Jesus. I would pray that in the middle of adversity, in the middle of hardship, in the middle of chaos, every Christian in this room and this church in particular would rise to the occasion that God has provided us for him to make much of himself through a people that knows that he is greater than we are. This is an opportunity for us to praise and to glorify him. And you remember that every single time a difficulty arises in your life. This is a God-given opportunity for you to praise and to glorify God. You're cursed with cancer. You have a bad diagnosis. This is an opportunity for you to glorify God. As the rest of the world would seemingly collapse under the stress, stress and pressure of it, your attitude to your friends, to your family, to the, visit, to the physician is, as we discussed in Sunday school this morning, God is good. And eventually they say, you know what? This God must be good if even in the bad times his people still praise him. Well, guess what? We don't praise God just because he does things for us that we consider good. We praise God not because of what he can do for us. That's the way every other person in your life loves you, like it or not, what you can do for them. We love God not because he does this thing for us or does that thing for us that we interpret ourselves to be good. We love God because he's God, because he's worthy of it in and of himself, that he's good whether or not what, we, what happens, we interpret ourselves to be blessings. And so we remember, we may be humbled now. God will exalt his servants. And you remember that for a humble little church, and you might be a little person in a little place called Sydney, Montana. God will exalt his faithful servants so that we might point to him. And then it says this in verse 7, a message that we definitely need today casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Boy, I don't know what a better year of the word would be, or a better word of the year would be for the year 2020 than the word anxiety. Anybody else nervous? I think I sat on edge so many times, I don't know how many times I fell off my seat. I couldn't be any further on the edge. The question from all of us has been, What's going to happen next? And then, I mean, the bad news, I suppose, is I think that there's a notion in our heads at the end of 2020 that now this is a new year and 2020 is gone. Right, those numbers, 2020, are now gone. But there is nothing magical about January 1st that makes those problems disappear, right? They will persist. The old year is gone, but the problems have stayed on, and, and, and many of them will continue. Even on top of that, I can promise you that new problems will arise as the old problems disappear. That's just part of life. Anybody nervous yet? What's going to happen next? What will be the next new thing that everyone will be talking about that will negatively impact us, that will call, cause us some type of harm or pain or hardship? I... I don't know, but I know that it's easy for me to have anxiety over it. You know, I went through life without hardly any anxiety until about 23 years of age, and I had a business collapse, and I, I got, I don't know, I've never been diagnosed, but to me it's like post-traumatic stress. I just, I have terrible anxiety, as those of you know. I, I've often told you, listen, if you love me, if you really love me, please don't ever text me and say, we need to talk, ever. because. Until I'm able to sit down with you, I'm going to think to myself, talk about what? 
Are you mad at me? What happened? What did I do? What did I do wrong? What's next? Is somebody dying? Are you dying? Am I dying? Did my doctor call you on accident? What possibly could be happening that I don't know about? I have terrible anxiety. Part of that comes from being a pastor when I know that if my phone rings after 10 o'clock at night, it's probably not good and someone's dead or hurting. It's, it's like being a first responder where that ring of the phone just makes you jump. I was finally able to point my fing- uh, to, to put my finger on what was making me jumpy uh, last year, and I took my phone off of ring altogether. I just use it as a pager now. Keep that in mind if you call me and I call you back instead of answering right away. I'm sorry. It makes me too anxious. I get a little bit jumpy. I'd rather see that you called and then call you back rather than to have this sound in my ear that's going to make my heart jump through my throat until I find out what's wrong with you because I'm, I'm worried about you. And that anxiety just continues forever, again, especially as a pastor. And I'll have you keep in mind that that's who we just got done addressing earlier in the passage was pastors. Imagine being responsible for the problems of three or four people, okay, and then you wake up the next day and you're a pastor and you're responsible for the problems of of 100 or 130 people. That's a lot of difficulty on your play. Well, what do we do about anxiety and how do we deal with it? Well, as someone who is prone to anxiety and understands it, I wanted to give a little bit of advice this morning about it. Uh, First of all, if you would, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Matthew 13, verse 22. Now, I want to explain something about anxiety. There's three different types of anxiety, at least as I see it. The first type of anxiety is a good anxiety. It's a good anxiety. By good, I mean that it serves uh, a purpose. Now, the word in Greek for cast your anxiety upon the Lord, if you're reading the King James, I believe it says cares, cast your cares upon the Lord. But in Greek, the word is marimna, marimna. And marimna actually means distraction better than anything else. So how is distraction better rendered or or otherwise rendered in English as anxiety. Here's why. When you have anxiety, your thought is always going back to that thing that you're anxious about. That's why when you say we need to talk, my first question is, is like who died? What's the problem? I can't get through my day. I need, let's settle this issue. I need to talk right now. I'm anxious about it. Or worse yet, when you get, when you get a, a, a letter that you have to assign for, certified mail, you get the note, you have certified mail. Good luck with that, right? If you're me, I'm go- I know what I'm doing. I am stopping right now. I'm going to the post office. I don't, I'm not expecting to be sued, but that's how it happens. I don't know. I just, it's terrifying to find out why is someone wanting to make sure that I'm, I'm signing for this thing. It's an unnatural anxiety. I can't get my mind off of it. I'm going to do it right now. That's the That's the, I suppose, not the first kind of anxiety. That's what I would call the second type of anxiety. It's just a bad anxiety. It's uh, not trusting that the Lord has this at the end of the day. God knows what's in the certified letter. Furthermore, he knew what you were going to get this morning. There is a sense in which a distracted thought or anxiety, in a sense, can be good. And that's when it's just making you be cautious and aware of your surroundings always keeping in mind that the world's not a terribly safe place. You should look around. As my father would say, watch your feet. As a matter of fact, the very next thing out of his mouth is he's going to be warning Christians, which we'll get into next week, that the devil is like a lion who roams the earth looking for someone to devour. Right after he got done saying, don't be nervous. Now you put, put those two things together. Don't be nervous. By the way, there's a lion outside. But we need not be distracted to the point that we're not trusting in God. And that would be the third type of anxiety. It's not good in that it doesn't serve a purpose. There's, there's no reason for it. There's a second type of anxiety, which is just negative. It hurts you. It doesn't serve a purpose. This third type of anxiety is like a, 
go so far as a sinful anxiety. What you're doing is, and this type of anxiety is explicitly distrusting God over his explicit promises. What I mean by that is, the scripture does not tell us to be Pollyanna. You know Pollyanna, a perennial optimist, the world is always good, the cup is always half full, all right? I don't know if you know a Pollyanna. Personally, they annoy me a bit. That's not Christianity. Christianity doesn't tell us to have faith that you're going to live when you get a cancer diagnosis. You don't know that, and God doesn't promise that. Can I just be real? That's not faith. God never tells us to have faith in what he doesn't promise. He tells us to have faith in what he does promise. And what God does promise is Jesus has conquered all sickness, disease, and death. Furthermore, not only has he conquered death, he conquered the grave and hell. And if cancer gets you this time around, your body will raise again from the dead one day. Your spirit will be reunited with your body. And he will then, at that point in time, completely cure your cancer. And we have faith in God, as Paul said, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So rather than having faith in what God has not promised, have faith in what God has promised. But if God has promised it, and we persist in doubting him, then that anxiety goes from being a little bit off, a mental quirk, something that you have to deal with, to actually becoming sin, because you're doubting the goodness of God. Now, before I get to this text in Matthew, let me say this. I had an elder approach me one time and say, anxiety is sinful. I asked him to explain. He said, anxiety is doubting God. Well, as I understand it, it can be, but not necessarily so. Sometimes humans are just nervous little critters. And it's not that they're doubting any given promise of God. It's that they always have that voice in the back of their head that says, something is going to happen next. And you know what? The Bible tells us life is short and full of sorrows. So it's not doubting God to believe that something is going to happen next. Something will happen next. But with understanding the scripture, we acknowledge something's going to happen next. At the same time, God is sovereign over our problems, and it's going to be okay. So look to Matthew chapter 6, if you would, and verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. It's not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now let me stop there for a moment. Obviously life is more than eating and more than being clothed. But to be perfectly honest, if you're naked and hungry, life is going to look like it's a lot about being clothed and eating. Right? You don't notice hunger until you're hungry, and then suddenly food does become all the more important. Jesus wasn't dismissing the necessity of eating or the necessity of wearing clothes, but his point was, it's not all there is. There's more to life than that. And when your anxiety is completely focused on the temporal things, little things, things that won't last, Frankly, what that means is you're a small-minded man because all you're focused upon are small-minded things. And there's a lot more out there than small-minded things. He says, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of no more value than they? Which of you by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. He says, look at the birds. God takes care of them. Are you not worth a lot more than a bird? I think I mentioned this recently. We were at Yellowstone National Park, and someone had asked who brought in the bears and feeds them at night. They couldn't imagine that things could just survive out there all on their own, and yet by God's design, by his creative ingenuity, by his omniscient wisdom, he's made a world in such a way that 
something that seemingly has a, I mean, not seemingly, it does have a tiny brain like a brain, is perfectly adapted and suited to survive in a wild and dangerous world. God takes care of them. He will take care of you. Beloved, I'm 39 years old, and I've walked with the Lord all the days of my life. Been in church since the time I was conceived. I don't believe I've ever missed a Sunday from church just because in my entire life. And I can tell you this as a testimony to God's goodness. God has always taken care of me. He's never let me go hungry. He's never allowed somebody to to get a single hit in on me that I didn't allow to happen where no was coming or partially deserve it. God has always gotten me out of bind after bind after bind in a way that's supernatural. I'm convinced of one thing. It's because God loves me. God loves me, and because of that, I know he will care for me. Let me flip the script a little bit and ask you a question similar to this one. You know how your kids never, ever ask you if they're having dinner, but only what's for dinner? I've mentioned this before. It's an epidemic. It's It's a sign of their entitlement. They never say, Mom, are we going to eat tonight? It's always, what are we going to eat tonight? Because they're a bit entitled. But they know from experience, from day after day, year after year, that you will feed them. They really have zero anxiety that they're going to eat something, right? Your kids know they will eat something. That's because they're sentient creatures. As opposed to cats, I've noticed, which think that they have never been fed, ever. No cat has ever been fed. They're all starving. They do not believe you'll ever feed them ever again. So it's wine, 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 wine. Sometimes three and four-year-olds can be that way. But by the time they're five, six, seven, ten, fifteen, they know just from life experience they're going to eat. It will happen. Beloved, isn't God a better father than your dad? Isn't he a better care provider than your mother? I don't know your, all of your parents. I know a lot of your parents, and some of them are really sweet people. God is better than them. That's all there is to it. He's better at it. Jesus asked the question, which one of you, if your sons came and asked for a piece of bread, would give him a serpent? Which one of you? Well, the answer is none of us. We wouldn't give him a snake when he's hungry and looking for a piece of bread. And Jesus' point is, right, and he's a better father than your father. So have confidence that when you ask God for a blessing, if it is in your favor and for his glory, he will do it. So you ask with confidence. By the way, having anxiety does not mean that we don't ask God for our daily bread. As a matter of fact, Jesus just got done in this chapter teaching them to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And then in the next portion of the of the discourse here on the Mount of Olives, Jesus says, but don't have anxiety about it. Well, why would I pray about something that I don't have anxiety about? We're looking at it backwards. The point is, if you pray about it, you won't have anxiety over it. Pray about it. And that's what it means here when it says to give to the Lord our burdens. The Psalms say, cast thy burdens upon the Lord and he'll sustain thee. He'll never suffer the righteous to be moved. God is asking for your anxieties and your burdens because he has a stronger back to shoulder them than what you do. So when you pray that the Lord take away your anxiety, once you give it to God, you give it to him. I gave it to him. I have people in my life that I need very much, and I need them to accomplish one task, and that is when I say handle it, it's handled. One of my pet peeves is when I say, uh, like, can you do this? Can you do this thing? And then that person says, sure. Can you remind me? I hate that. No, because what that is, that's removing mental clutter from my head so I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't, if I have to remind you, I might as well do it myself. Does that make sense? If I give it to you, I just want to give it to you and know that it's completely taken care of. And I always tell children the number one, like, 
character trait that you need to have in your life is competency so that when someone asks you to handle it, they can know it's handled because you're a competent person. Well, guess what? When you give something to the Lord, he's plenty competent to take care of it. Give it to him. So remember those three different kinds of anxiety that I talked about? There's, there's a helpful type of anxiety. That's just to make you aware, to keep your eyes out for danger, common sense preparations in a volatile world. There's a bad sense in which anxiety is, is, uh, is counterproductive to us. That's when we're, we're, we're having anxiety over things that's God's control. If we can't control that thing, would you admit with me that it's not worth worrying about? If we can't control it, if we can't fix it, there's no reason to have anxiety over it. I think we should all be able to admit by now, just being real with you, nobody can stop coronavirus, and we got no idea what we're doing. How about that? No one really knows. We're figuring this out, and least of all, the medical community. Everyone is flying by the seat of their pants. The odd thing is, it's almost as as if, now hear me out, this is a crazy idea, but it's almost as if the government wasn't given the capacity to heal disease. I know it sounds odd and call me crazy, but I'm thinking that's God's territory. That's a Messiah level miracle that people like Jesus pull off and there's only one Jesus. We have no control over it. Zero. So how much anxiety is it worth if you can't control it? If the most brilliant minds on earth are so flatly wrong much of the time over the course of events, why do we let them even make us more anxious by their constant proclamations if they have no idea what they're doing? How about this? God is fully in charge. And he's good, and that's good for us. So I'm going to sleep tonight like a baby, and I'm going to eat, and I'm going to feast to the glory of God. I have no idea if tomorrow's coming, but if tomorrow doesn't come, it's only for one reason. Jesus has already come. That's the only reason tomorrow will not come and the sun will not rise. That's it. Jesus Christ has come, and that's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing. We have many promises from God that ought to take away our anxiety. As I said, God doesn't promise us that life is, is going to be a bowl of cherries or that everything is going to be perfect. As a matter of fact, it gives disclaimers that it's not. But we do have certain promises from God. God's made many of them, that he would prosper and bless his people. Individually, some will perish. But overall, God will bless. We're We have a a great promise that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that when we ask forgiveness for our sins, it is not an if, it is not a maybe whether or not God will forgive us. It is a definite. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not contingent. That's a promise. It will come to pass. If you do this, God will do that. We have promises from God. And in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45 says, Not one word of all of the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had gone unfulfilled. All had come to pass. God's promises will come to pass. That is such an extraordinarily good thing. The last verse I want us to turn to today is Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah. I want to look at the Old Testament just for a moment. So far as curses and, and bitterness are concerned, difficulties, chaos, crises, and our anxiety of them. Did I say, oh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah 8.10. I had marked Nahum 8.10. Nehemiah tells the Lord in this passage, if you look to the second part, part B, that your joy, that is the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Our strength in the midst of adversity 
is the joy of God and our joy of God. If we can't find happiness in the middle of difficulty, we'll not find it at all. You know what? Looking back over my life, of the seasons that were the most chaotic, I can see God's hand of protection over me more powerfully there than at any other time. And I think of God, I can't believe that you got me through that. But never did I doubt that it was God that got me through it. Make sure that as you look forward to the next year, 2021, that you can clearly distinguish in your mind between the common sense, paying attention, the thought in the back of your mind that you should be watching your feet and washing your back, that's good. That you can differentiate between that and a type of anxiety that says, I'm afraid because I don't have faith that God is really in charge. You know what I've noticed is, for lost people, when they find out that God is completely in charge, it terrifies them. But for the saved person, we rejoice in it because we recognize that God is far better off in control than we are. He's much more capable than we are. He's powerful, he's good, he's God, and most importantly, when it comes to anxiety, He's got this. Father, we thank you for the kindness that you've displayed to us in Christ. And we thank you for your scripture that you wrote it down into words so that we might properly understand it, pass it on to our children without it being stretched or skewed or taken out of context. And I pray that you would illumine our minds to understand what we've heard from your text. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand, we have one more song.